Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're connecting from today. This is Brenda Haug, and I will be your facilitator for today's session on youth-led tech at the library. We're here with special guest Jennifer Nichols from Pima County in Arizona. She'll be talking about some of their youth-led technology initiatives. Before we get started with Jennifer, hearing from Jennifer, I do want to tell you about ReadyTalk, which is the software that we're using today. Things you can do, you can chat, and you may have noticed some messages coming through already. Kevin Lowe is here today as our co-producer. He can help with tech difficulties. He can um, help us keep track of questions, that sort of thing. So Kevin is here. And if you're having any tech difficulties, just let us know in the text chat. You can also raise your hand and that will give Kevin a heads up to check in with you. All lines are muted except for mine and Jennifer's. And if you lose your internet connection, the best thing to do is usually just to try come back in again. Go back to the email with the connection information and then connect it again. And same thing if you are connecting using the phone today, you can just redial the number and rejoin. If you have really big tech trouble and you're not able to get back in, there is a number there for ReadyTalk support as well. But hopefully we can troubleshoot what we need to troubleshoot here with Kevin's help. Just a note about this session, it is being recorded and it will be available on the TechSoup website along with past webinar presentations. So that's a, if you have tech issues and get disconnected and just can't get back in, know that that recording is available. Later today I'll send you an email with um, all sorts of things. Let's see, it will have the PowerPoint from today, it will have a link to the recording from today, and then any websites that are mentioned during the session, I will also um, include them. So you'll get a, that follow-up email later today that will include all of that information. So don't worry about jotting down web addresses or anything like that. You'll get a follow-up email that has all of that within it. Okay. So again, today's session is Youth-Led Tech at the Library. And I'm very happy to have with us Jennifer Nichols, who's a senior librarian at the Pima County Public Library in Tucson. She's been there since 2006 and has helped cultivate several youth-led projects at the library, including a teen advisory board and, and the LSPA grant-funded program Create IT. We'll hear a lot about those um, later in the session. So Jennifer, do you just want to say hi? Hi everybody. I hope you can hear me. It's nice to be here with you today. Yes, loud and clear. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so in today's session we're going to I'll introduce TechSoup and TechSoup for Libraries. And then this webinar is part of a series of webinars on the edge benchmarks. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those are too. So TechSoup, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and its role is to help serve other nonprofit organizations, help them with their technology needs. And lots of libraries are familiar with TechSoup because of the technology donation program where you can get really low cost software. And again, the follow-up email will include a, a link to this too. There's a special section of TechSoup that's just for libraries, that's really focused on libraries, and that's TechSoup for Libraries. And this webinar is, is through TechSoup for Libraries. And I'll put a, a link in the follow-up email too that will take you right to TechSoup for Libraries. I mentioned that today's webinar is part of a series of webinars on the EDGE benchmarks. And the EDGE initiative, if you, if you haven't heard it yet, haven't heard about it yet, is a coalition of leading library and government organizations. It includes the Urban Libraries Council, the Public Library Association, it includes TechSoup, it includes Web Junction, several state libraries. And this group is working together to develop benchmarks, that technology benchmarks that will help libraries evaluate and continually improve their tech services. And there are 13 of, this ben of those benchmarks. And this is our third webinar covering a bench the benchmarks. 
And I'm curious if we have people who are, are with us today who have been at any of the others. So you should be seeing a poll on your screen. In August we talked about helping people with e-readers, the first benchmark. In September we talked about Library U, which is a digital content creation project, and that is the second benchmark. And then today we're talking about, about getting community input on technology projects. Okay, so it looks like we have some people who attended the one in September, but for a lot of people this is your first webinar. Great, thank you. And again, today's is on Benchmark 7, and that says the library gathers feedback from the community about its public technology needs. And so today we're really going to focus on specifically youth and getting youth input into the technology the library provides. So with that, that takes us up to the, the real content of our day, which is talking to Jennifer about youth-led technology at the library. And we're going to start just by um, hearing from her about some of the things that, that have taken place at Pima County. Feel free to use the text chat to do that, and we'll be keeping track of, we'll be keeping track of those questions. So we'll give Jennifer a chance to tell us about all of the different things they're doing, and then at the end we'll devote a lot of time to going back and answering those questions. So again, feel free to ask them at any time in the text chat. We'll be keeping track of them, and then we'll have lots of time at the end where we'll go through and respond to them. Okay, well with that I think I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. Can you just tell us um, about the, the youth-led technology initiatives at the Pima County Public Library? Sure. Thanks, Brenda. So um, PCPL has a long history of engaging teens in decision making uh, regarding the teen services that we offer. So I'm going to back up a little bit to um, before I got here. Um, over 15 years ago, we got a big grant from the Wallace Foundation. It was a four-year grant, um, which was really um, the point of it was to gather teen input about the services that we offered to teens in the library. And it was around this point that we were just beginning to offer computers and online access to our patrons. So the technology decisions were just beginning, and really we're going to just grow from there. So what we found in that um, four-year grant was that teens really overwhelmingly wanted job opportunities. No surprise, nothing really has changed since then. Um, so we developed a job training program where we could train teens to become computer aides in our libraries. And they really helped develop the curriculum at that point. Um, one of our staff members became an adjunct professor at the community college, so then they also not only um, developed the curriculum, took the class, but they received college credit for taking that training and then um, they were given a job at the library. So um, to this day, we still have teen computer monitors as well as teen pages, and we work with um, the Pledge a Job program in, in our county. Um, sometimes uh, we get extra federal funds and things like that um, during stimulus times to allow us to employ teenagers in our libraries regularly. So. Um, when that four-year grant went away, we kept the teens. Um, some of them are permanent employees today. Some are some of our success stories. Um, we still have some that are computer instructors, and even one that's gone on to get their PhD in law. So we're really proud of what we started way back then. Um, but out of that grant, we also developed a teen advisory board, which was actually in partnership with the City of Tucson. Um, and at, at that time, we were part of the city, and we are now a county organization. Um, and that Teen Advisory Board still exists, and they didn't make just decisions for the library, but for um, all sorts of departments within the city. Um, and then we developed our Teen Advocate Program, which some of you may have heard of. Um, it's still running strong today, and that program gives teens $100 to give five outreach presentations to their peers about what the library has to offer for them. So those um, were the beginnings of it. Um, some other things that we Sorry, I have a slide about it, um, but they're really linked here for you to look um, after the presentation, so we'll skip over it. Um, so the next thing that we did that was really um, 
teen driven was a program called That's My Take, and that's a video program of um, book trailers. And we have gotten some press over the years uh, for it. We've kind of um, evolved from that um, into multiple video projects. But That's My Take was really um, teen driven in that the teens um, every summer would get together and they would pick the books that they wanted to create book trailers for which were basically like a movie trailer, and they would write the script, um, and they would direct the film. Um, and every year we tried to reevaluate how that was going and add more and more youth-led components. So um, at the, the first one we had our partner, which is a local film company. They did a lot of the editing. They were really refined. They looked really beautiful, but really the teens weren't learning any of those skills. So Though um, the quality of the final product did go down towards the end, the amount of youth involvement and the skills that they developed throughout that program increased. And we really wanted to start focusing on what are the teams really taking away um, from the program. So that was, I think, really our foray into how do we make the programs that we um, offer to teens um, have much more of their own input and then um, the benefits that they're getting are growing. So um, when I started, I was working at a library called Quincy Douglas. It was in um, a pretty high risk area of town, and there's not much else going on in that um, neighborhood besides the library. So there are a lot of students. And they were getting a, uh, federal weed and seed money in that community, which some of you may have heard of. It's since dried up. But um, weed and seed really brought all of the different service organizations and the police. Um, together so that they could solve community problems. And they had a teen advisory board that they're getting going, and um, the library kind of jumped in, and we did it in partnership with a behavioral health organization. And that allowed us to do things that the library teen advisory board alone would not be able to do. So they had transportation, they could feed the kids, they could attend political events that I couldn't as a county employee, so the kids could go and talk to the board of supervisors about the issues in their community. Um, and really advocate for things like that. But then they would also come to those weed and seed meetings and they would talk about the, the issues that they see going on and the solutions that they could propose. They would ask for things that they wanted. Um, so in that process, we talked a lot about what they wanted to do and said, you know, it sounds like you just need to share your stories and tell, you know, tell people what it's like um, to live where you live and to, to be who you are. So they decided to write this grant um, to an organization called Every Voice in Action, which was really a pinnacle, um, maybe that's not the right word, but um, it's, it was a great example of a youth-led organization. And it's still in existence. They recently evolved a little bit. Um, but they were a foundation that had a completely um, youth-led board. So that board made all funding decisions. They received all the proposals. They read them, and they decided what would be funded with the money. Um, and I don't know of any other organization that has an, um, a foundation that actually is only youth awarded. Now they still have money, um, but they're operating a charter school. And so they're, they're, um, instead of soliciting proposals, the students are actually coming up with the ideas for um, where to put the money in their community and approaching organizations. So they're doing it a little differently now. But it's a really wonderful organization. And um, so they gave us $10,000 to do three storytelling workshops. And I linked some of the stories here if you're interested. Um, later I'll tell you about one of the students that um, came through our program and really how she's grown. So, um, and I point this out because we were asking them to make decisions about technology, but really I think what we're asking when we say we want to have youth-led technology is we really want to have a strong community. And we really want our youth to be empowered um, with all the skills to be successful. And so we might be asking them to make technology decisions for us, but it's not really ultimately about that. You know? so, um, and you'll see that crossover as I talk about the programs. We want them to be making those decisions for us, but it's not the final end result or the, the only thing we hope for. So um, the two big programs that um, I'm in charge of right now that we um, are running, one is called IT Nation. I put up there that it's IT Girls. 
um, because that's where it started as a partnership with the Saguaro Girl Scout Council here. And um, the woman that started the program for us at the time was a library student intern, and she was employed by the Girl Scout. So she started this great partnership, um, and it was directed at girls. And they get 40 hours of training in um, basic music, uh, um, music editing, photo editing, video editing, internet uh, safety, and then they teach those classes to the public. So in some libraries, the public means senior citizens. Sometimes it's teens, their peers. Sometimes it's a mix of people. But we train them over the semester or this summer we did a two-week intensive training. Um, and then they go out and teach these classes and they get paid $200. Uh, we've trained five cohorts so far, over 100 students. Um, and some of them have come back and taught for us every semester and earned that $200. Um, and that curriculum is really, um, has a lot of youth input. As they teach a class, they give us feedback. They, they get feedback from the students and they give us their feedback. And we change the curriculum based on what they have to say works and doesn't work. As well, we use a lot of open source software and you know, those things go away periodically and we need to come up with a new curriculum. So the students um, explore all their options. They write the curriculum that's going to fit that software. Um, so it's really helped us. We'll talk a little bit about the continuum of youth-led um, engagement, and it really has taken us along that continuum to more and more youth engagement in technology decisions for us. Um, so now it's called IT Nation because we do invite boys to be a part of it. Um, and we are not currently partnering with the Girl Scout Council, though they're still interested in being um, a partner. We in Tucson, or in Arizona, I guess, have just become part of the National Girls Collaborative, which is a STEM, federal STEM initiative. So um, they are interested in still continuing to support us. We're really looking forward to growing that program. Um, and then Create It is a program that started last year. We got a very big LSTA grant, and we're really lucky to start something where um, we offer technology and media classes for teens. Uh, these are taught by professional instructors. Um, and the point of the classes is to help the students make connections with real professionals in their community, but also that they're interest-driven classes. So they, they decide what they want to create. And it was really conceived out of um, a lot of us attending a webinar about U Media several years ago and thinking, this would be really great. We'd love to do it. Um, and how can we do that? So we in Pima County, we're spread over 9,000 square miles, which is bigger than the state of New Jersey. Um, so we can't necessarily serve all of our youth with one uh, media center. Um, but we had a lot of equipment from IT Nation, um, That's My Take, all sorts of different other programs we've done. And we realized we can take the equipment we have in the libraries that we have and start there. And at least we could get something started. And so we've been exploring that in, in communities where we have a lot of youth that use the libraries and they're just in the building and they need something to do, as well as in uh, more uh, suburban rural areas where there aren't a lot of other things to do. So we're trying different classes in different areas and having um, success in different ways. So I'm happy to speak to anyone about that in depth because we're still evolving and growing. Um, but some of the things that we've done that are really youth-led are um, we've hired a graphic designer to work with the students to develop their own logos. And we thought this is you know, the best way to start, especially with Create It. We didn't know what to even call the program. So we, we advertised this opportunity to work with a graphic designer, develop a logo, and he taught them how to interview clients, how to do everything that he needed they needed to do if they were a graphic designer. And someone said, I have this idea. How can you help me market it? So he taught them how to do that. They interviewed us. We told them what we wanted. And they made, came up with this, um, with the name of the program, Create It, and the slogan, and they designed it. And now they see it used all over town on their posters and on our website. And um, we've got a lot of positive feedback from the parents and students who participated in that. They also developed a logo for IT Nation and another community organization. And constantly 
we get kids saying, I want to be a graphic designer, I want to be a graphic designer. And when they finish this class, they say, well, what's next? You know, they're ready to go. And we're realizing that we really are trying to build that bridge for them for their career. So they're making a connection and they're knowing someone who actually makes a living doing what it is they dream of doing. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we're presently up till now working on. Jennifer, this is Brenda. There have been some questions that are about the specific programs. This might actually be a good time to, to give some of those to you. Um, one, someone wonders, is the curriculum for, for IT Nation available for sharing? Is the curriculum for IT Nation available for sharing? Yes. We're happy to share it. And um, at the end of the webinar, I will, you'll have my contact information, and we can um, talk about doing that. Okay, great. And then there was a question about, this was earlier on I think when we were talking about the advisory board, but what did board training look like? What kind of democratic decision making methods did you teach? Was it consensus? Was it Robert's rules? What did board training look like? That's a great question. I have not been a part of that, um, that initial teen advisory board. I've run, in my own advisory board we did um, we didn't do Robert's rules. We, we did more of a consensus-based um, training if we had to make decisions. We did try doing officer um, elections, but what we found was that they were really shy to put themselves forward as a leader. And so what we want, needed to do was develop their sense that they are leaders, and, and natural leaders um, being who they are. So, we did it for a, probably a semester. You know, you're the president, you're the vice president, and these are your roles. And then they kept wanting to swap their roles. So we decided to, we're going to scrap that and we're going to be, everyone's equal at the table. So um, when we have to make a decision, we're going to go around and everyone's going to say if they have any concerns. And any concerns are raised, we're going to talk about them. And if they're not, then we're going to assume that we've decided that that's okay. So it was loosely based on consensus without all the long, painful pauses. <laughs> okay. I hope good. that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Um, let's see, a couple questions about funding. One was, well, it was about the LSTA grant actually, and does your library filter or was the grant used for non-internet connected technology? How did you work with that? LSTA Our library needs to be filtered. Okay, our library does filter. Um, we did use some of the LSTA funds to buy laptops, and so everything on the Wi-Fi is filtered um, naturally. So even though they weren't on our network with connecting with a card, they were going to they were filtered because they're on Wi-Fi. Um, but we also let's see. So for video classes. Um, you know, I don't really think, I can't think of any situations where filtering was an issue for us in any way. Um, most of it is, is about them creating content. Um, it wasn't a lot of remixing of content. Um, we haven't had anything come up that was inappropriate that they made. So um, I'm not sure if there's more you're interested in knowing or if there's just blockages. I know at schools filtering can also can really limit what you can connect to, so maybe that's more of the issue, but we don't have that here. And you mentioned that the teens were, taught, were paid to teach the courses. Um, where did the funding sources to pay the graphic designer and to pay the teens to teach the courses, what were the funding sources for those things? Okay, so IT Nation, just to distinguish, IT Nation pays students. We used our staff to train them, so um, no outside presenters were paid to train the, the teens. And then um, the funding actually came from our library foundation. Um, they paid the stipends for the students for the IT Nation. For Create It, it was an LSTA grant, and so we paid um, the graphic designer to teach that class with those funds. And then um, we taught classes, so all of fall and spring semester and the summer was really intensive. A lot of classes were being taught. And we um, did hire teen mentors to help the teachers. They were not the instructors. They were the assistants to the instructors. And that was all paid from LSTA money. And so now that the LSTA grant is finished, we have written, um, created, and IT Nation are both written into our regular operating budget for youth services. 
know, Peg, another question, wondering if you have a union at the library, and if so, how you deal with the issues of employing teens to do things that staff might otherwise do. Okay, do we have a union at the library? There is an optional union. Um, hiring teens is kind of twofold. For the county, they hire um, 18 and older. So we work with, I think I mentioned, the Pledge a Job program through Pima County One Stop. So they hire teenagers um, to, for, for regular jobs. For these classes, they're not considered jobs of the library. They are, we have um, personal service agreements with the students, and then um, it's seen as an internship opportunity. Okay. Well, I, we're getting more in. Let's let them build up again, and then we'll, we'll go back. So getting lots of very interested questions, so I think that demonstrates that people are either also thinking about um, getting more use put into library technology, or it's also something that some of you are already doing. So just here's another poll. Where would you rank what you've done at your library? How much have you incorporated youth input into the library's tech technology? Is it something you haven't really done yet, something you've done a little, or would you say it's something you've done a lot? Watch that poll. Okay, interesting. Okay, so it looks like we've got the majority of people weighing in, and four who have done a lot, which I would say Pima County is also in that, that category, and then pretty evenly dispersed between haven't yet and have done a little bit. So that's interesting. I think that um, we're going to really focus on getting Jennifer's advice. So for those of you who haven't yet done this or who have only done a, a little, I think this will be especially especially useful. And for those of you who have done a lot, we encourage you to share links and share ideas in the text chat, and we'll gather those too as well as questions. All right. Okay, so it seems like this would be a good time to talk about what we mean by youth-led. Okay. That, yeah, great. Okay, so um, youth-led is really a spectrum. Um, you can see here this is adapted from um, Hearts Ladder, and there's a link there. You can find more information about it. But um, it starts with um, number one would be the least amount of youth involvement. And everything that I mentioned before is somewhere on that spectrum. We are not at number nine, and I don't actually think that we are striving to be at number nine, which is totally youth initiated um, and directed. So. I would say that libraries are going, or at least, all right, I'll say that <laughs> libraries should look towards a seven, you know, as an ultimate. Um, they're youth and adult conceived um, and led. So we are probably not going to be in a position to have youth just make budget decisions for us and run a program. It's not something that's realistic, you know, for a a governmental organization today. I wouldn't say that it's not a good thing to have a goal of, but um, realistically all of our programs fall somewhere on that spectrum. And in my own career I've definitely moved from uh, number one up to number seven. I've been very guilty of um, tokenism, which I think if you really honestly look at some of the things that we do, almost everything is there hovering around that. Um, we have a representation by a few youth. So I'm sure we've all been to those meetings where we're talking about youth and we say, we've invited the youth and you know, they just didn't come. And so one comes and we ask them what they want and then we say, the youth said that they want this. And it's, you know, it's just how, how we are used to operating. It's normal. And, um, but those questions are really starting to get raised of like, why if we want to serve youth and we have all of this money to serve youth, um, well, I don't know about all this money, but if you have some money to serve youth, wouldn't you really want their input? And what is getting in the way of you genuinely wanting to talk to them? Um, because if you need to find youth, there are places where youth are, and you need to go to them. So um, this is a great um, guide to keep you 
always questioning, you know, how much are we doing? Is there more that we could be doing? Um, and where are the things that, that we provide along this ladder? So I encourage you to use it in that way. Um, it's certainly not the easy way out. It's an investment um, in our community and in the youth themselves. And um, so it's not for everyone. You know? And sometimes if you even think that this is something you want your organization to do, but you're not, you might not be the right person to do it. Um, because it's kind of a theoretical idea of getting youth involved, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to, to um, train youth with the skills that you want them to have, but also to get out of the way a little bit and be able to listen to what they have to tell you because it's not always what we want um, to hear, I guess. It's not always the easy way. So um, with that, we can talk a little bit about why we would even do it at all. <laughs> um, and so the first thing, of course, is the youth buy-in and sense of ownership. So I hear a lot from people um, that um, we want the teens to use our library more. You know, we have all of these programs and not that many teens come, or we have all of these great resources. We have books. We have homework help. We have this and that, and they're not really using them. Um, so if they're involved in the decisions, even if it's a teen advisory board and they get to make, choose um, one program that they want to have every year, or they get to um, have input on the amount of books that are bought, or the types of books that are bought, or make displays. They have buy-in and ownership in your space even, or your programs um, that can't be replaced. And that just grows the more decision-making power they have, I guess. So um, for example, one of our goals is to build a media center. So when we designed the planning process, the planning process is to be really youth-led in that we build a youth board that goes out to the community and surveys um, people and what they want, and then um, works with the designers to design the space. And that is really going to create the buy-in and the ownership versus us creating a space that we work with, never you know, the tokenism of showing it to some youth. You think that's cool. You think that's nice. And then presenting it and hoping that they'll come. If they're involved in the process, they'll be there when it opens. So, um, and then their skill development. I mean, again, I think I said this before. It's not really about what technology we're going to buy in the end, because no one's going to die if we buy the wrong software or computers. But um, the benefits of their in their life and in our community are so much stronger because of their involvement. So the skill development they'll get from leadership, responsibility, communication, collaboration. I mean skills, 21st century skills. There's all these different frameworks that you can apply and you could use any of them. Asset-based community development, 21st century skills, common core. You know, there's all these different ways to look at what we want our youth to have. But in the end, they'll be developing skills that they need. And then you'll have a really strong community. Um, these students will interact with their peers, with mentors, adults, and um, other youth, and with their community at large. And being able to get them involved at that level will really make a difference in your community in the long run. So, um, I think that addresses that. <laughs> um, okay. Can you think of examples of, you know? I think these are. This is great what you have on here, but just I'm wondering if there are certain stories or examples that come to mind of of how how being involved in these programs has made a difference in the lives of teens in your community. Okay. Well, we have um, one story of um, a girl who was in IT Girls. She was in the first cohort, and the story goes that she was in the juvenile detention center and she was involved in their Girl Scout troop, um, and so found out that IT Girls was happening. And when she um, got out of the juvenile detention center, she went to the IT Girls training, did the training. She was teaching classes in the community, and they were doing a presentation. Kristen Curie is the woman who started the program. Um, she was doing a presentation at the Arizona Library Association. So they asked her and a couple of other girls to come along with them and present about their experience. And they did. 
And when she got up in front of the group, they were a little worried because she's really shy. And she got up and she told them her whole story about how she had gotten into trouble, and she found this program, and her life is so much better. She met all these wonderful people, and she's making money, and she's going to school, and she's so happy. And then later that year, she was honored with the Pima Award for Youth, which is a great honor. I mean, they, they're in a banquet hall of 1,000 people giving a talk, and tears are flowing. It was a really beautiful story of how she was connected um, into her community and made these relationships and um, is able to give back. And she's taught, she didn't teach this summer, the first time she didn't teach. So she taught for four semesters straight after that. And um, so she's been a great example. And another one I will throw out there is um, a young woman named Anna. I put a link in here later to a New York Times story about her. But she was coming to my library and um, was part of our digital storytelling and our teen advisory board. And then we were having our first festival of books at the university, and we were bringing Matt de la Pena in. And none of these girls, they didn't come to the library because they liked to read. They came to the library because they liked to get on the computer and see their friends. So they, I got them to read this book, Mexican White Boy. I said, you know, I think you'll really like it. He's really great. Well, they read it. They loved it. They met him. and he's. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he's super cute and kind and personable. He friended them all on Facebook, and everyone was happy. And um, you know, he's recommending to them that they read Cormac McCarthy as follow-up to him. <laughs> and it was just wonderful wow. to see that. Um, you know, definitely like a librarian's dream or something. But um, so she last year came into a creative class and said, Jen, you know, I've been talking to Matt on Facebook, and I really want to bring him back to Tucson. And he's not, you know, he said, yeah, that sounds good, but he hasn't really responded to me specifically. So we were doing a sound production class. I said, why don't you record an invitation to him? So she jumped on the computer and she quickly, you know, made a little recording, edited it, sent it to him, and he responded the next day. I'll come. All you have to do is cover my expenses. You don't have to pay me anything. And so she did, and the article kind of talks a little bit about how she did it. Um, well, actually, it doesn't talk about how she did it, but that she brought him here in the wake of the Mexican American Studies program getting suspended at Tucson High, um, and that has been national headlines. And he was one of the authors that was um, banned, I guess you could say, from from the um, Tucson Unified School District. His book was one of the books, so it ended up being a huge deal. So he brought a New York Times reporter with him. And um, so I was very proud of her for following through, but also that we were such a big part of her life. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, um, let's see. We have a lot more questions. Do you want to take some more of those now, or do you have any other tips or advice, the general tips or advice, before we move on to the questions? Sure, we can do that last slide and then just answer questions for the rest okay. of the time. Um, so I just wanted to throw out there, um, thinking about people who um, are just getting started, and with that poll, it looks like a lot of you are. Um, you know, it's been a long process to get youth more involved, and it's not you're not usually in the um, majority of people in your organization. So <laughs> um, first of all, you know, you want to be nice to yourself and um, keep on going because it's. There's a lot of research out there, and there's a lot of support um, beyond the library walls about why you want to um, have youth involved in, in decision making. Um, but acknowledging your bias is a great place to start because it's real, and um, it will just keep getting in the way. Um, I've been to a lot of trainings where they ask the adults to talk about their bias about youth, and then they ask the youth to talk about their bias about the adults. And it's a great way to start and just get it out in the open. Um, and acknowledge it because there's a lot of them. I mean, simple things of like kids don't know what they're talking about. They, they can't handle a budget. They don't know all the stress we're under. You know, there's a lot of um, things that can get in the way of you trusting one another. So um, be consistent. I mean, anyone who is a parent or worked with students before will know that um, it is really important to be consistent and to really listen to what the students are saying. Um, we often talk about taking breaks of our teen advisory boards or things like that, but um, 
sometimes the youth, especially um, in populations where they don't have a lot of caring adults, they really need a consistent adult in their life. And if it's just that the meeting is for them to get together, you have no agenda, you're in and out of the room, but they're, you're there meeting and they know that you're going to be there every time that you say you will, it's really helpful to build that sense of trust. Um, speak normally, <laughs> I put that in there because we like to use a lot of jargon, and um, I catch myself sometimes, but my friend was telling me a really funny story about this woman, and she just couldn't understand what she was saying. And um, I thought I wrote it down somewhere, but she, um, she would say sentences like, well, I hope the outcomes we can measure by the matrix of positive correlation will yield significant advancement toward measurable goals deemed acceptable by the funders. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we probably all have met someone like that before. <laughs> and I think we sound like that to teenagers sometimes when we're talking to them. So it's something to remember. Um, the go where they are is so simple. It's hard to get kids to come to. If, you're, if your goal is to get more kids to use the library, then don't hold an event at the library if you're trying to get them to come to the library. You know, go to the schools, places, you know, civics classes, places that are service organizations where kids are really looking for opportunities. Um, and they'll start to come to you once you make that relationship with them. Um, and then recognize them for their contributions. Um, we realized there's a lot of carrots we could put out there, but the recognition was the big one. There's a lot of research talking about that these days. Um, David Weidenberger is one of my favorite people who talks about um, um, how knowledge, our knowledge base is changing and um, you know, people are contributing their knowledge for the sake of knowledge, not to get paid or anything beyond that. And you can look at um, open source software as an example of that. So um, then respecting their knowledge and experience. You know, if you are asking them, then you really need to respect what they have to say. Um, not everything you're going to be able to follow through on, but you can acknowledge that um, they know about being teenagers and they know about technology. I mean, we've all been there where we need the teenager to start our smartphone or turn on the TV with the seven remotes. So um, really respecting them and then following up on what you say you're going to do. It really makes a difference. So I think that's all I had to share, and I would love to just answer questions. Okay. Well, we have a lot of them, so let's go ahead. One question was, how do you recruit the teens? Are they teens who are already active in the library, or do you actively seek out teens who aren't coming to the library? How do we recruit teens? We, um, for IT Nation, we recruit through the schools, so we send it to all of our young adult librarians. We have 28 branches at Pima County, so um, we have a lot of inroads to different um, teen communities, and we ask them all to go out and invite students. Because they get paid, it's never a challenge to fill those classes. Um, we do have attrition like all of our programs, um, but at the beginning of every semester, we have a lot of students show up with the prospect of getting paid. Um, for Create It, we have our own Facebook page. Um, we also send it out to a listserv of all the prior students. And um, we try to use the school networks as well. Because really, when you ask the students how they found out, if it wasn't from their parent, it was from another caring adult in their life. So they are not the ones who are picking up the flyers. It's the adults. Um, but then they'll tell their friends. And then they'll come back for other classes. Okay, and then some questions about staffing. How many staff are on your team to assist with training and facilitation of these programs? Are you a one-woman shop? Is there a whole department? And how do programs get funneled up or down the decision-making ladder? Okay, there's a lot of questions in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> staffing. Right now I feel like a one-woman show, but it's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> We, because we don't actually have a physical media center, um, we have written a grant. We're waiting to hear about that. And if that comes through, we will probably have more staffing de devoted to it. But I have a team that meets. We've met a couple of times. Um, Kristen, who ran IT Nation, just left us for another great job somewhere else. Um, and so I just inherited IT Nation, so it, that's why it feels like a one-woman job. But 
in fact, there were two of us running them. And then I have had um, graduate students from the library school um, helping. And then all of the libraries that host them, they have a set of obligations. So they help us recruit and advertise. They staff the classes. So they are physically present while the classes are going. And so my role is really the coordinator role. And then that team, we get together to talk about bigger things of you know, what are our um, what are the policies that need to be developed? Um, what kind of marketing things do we need to work on? That type of thing. Okay, another question from someone who looks at Hard Ladder and wants to get to a higher level but doesn't have the support from administration. Do you have any thoughts on that? On building um, building in. I guess administrative support or getting um, getting others in the organization on board with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly helps. I mean, I have been blessed with administrators that really believe in um, in youth decision making. Um, so I would say there is a lot of research out there. Starting at the Innovation Center is a great place to start. Um, there's probably some other resources that I would be happy to. Um, send you that will help to make the case. Um, I, don't, I would look beyond library research for that. I think there's a bigger picture um, out there about getting youth involved um, in community decisions and organizational decisions. Um, I haven't myself found a lot of research based in, within libraries to support that. But I'm happy if you want to send me a private message to um, help connect you with more resources. Okay, this one, the so why information. Um, I love the why information. Can you tell us how you measure the outcomes? Um, how we measure the outcomes of what of why we have youth-led programs? Um, yeah. Well, the outcomes um, for Create It, for example, were the amount of students. We limited it really to the amount of students that participated and the amount of digital products that they produced because everything else is not a measurable outcome. Um, they're anecdotal stories. And with LSTA funding, we're really grateful that we can include those anecdotal stories as evidence that we made a difference in, with them. Um, with the resources that we used um, because I think that's part of the mindset shift really. That's the paradigm that you're trying to shift. That we, if we constantly try to measure ourselves against children's story time numbers, for example, we're not going to compare because that's not what we're, we're about building relationships and making really you know, life-changing um, relationships, and not that story time isn't, but we're never going to have those numbers because that's not how youth operate, and that's not how they participate. And you know, it brings up a point that if you're successful, you'll probably lose them to doing all the other things that they have been connected to. I mean, libraries are connectors, and we've lost a lot of really great students, but not because they're dropping out of school and getting pregnant and moving away, it's because they are on the track team and they're on student council and they got a job and they're going to college and they're busy, you know. And so we you have to count that as a success too and then you don't have the numbers anymore. So um, it is a paradigm shift I think. Good question about funding. So you've mentioned different sorts of grant funding that have enabled you to do the things that you've done. Um, what about after the grants after the grants are done and the programs become part of your budget? Um, was your overall budget increased or were other areas trimmed or and was there any kind of resistance to those budget increases or did the benefits of these programs just make it make it a no brainer? Um, well so the LSTA grant when it ended, I was given $12,000 to continue create it for this year. Um, and that is under the assumption that we have all the equipment that we need. So that's just to pay for presenters. So I feel like that's more than adequate. Um, I just made a new partnership with the University of Arizona's Computer Science Department. 
and they have agreed to um, make any computer science classes that their students teach uh, based on credit, so we don't actually have to pay them anything. So there are ways to do classes for free. Um, I, so I don't anticipate $12,000 being a problem. As far as IT Nation, because I just got it, I can't remember exactly how much the budget is, but I want to say, I mean the whole budget is all stipends for the students. So if we're looking at, I think it's like $5,000 for them to teach classes this year. I mean it's, it's not very expensive because we have the training, um, which I said before we're happy to share, and so we train the students. So that doesn't cost anything. Um, it was naturally folded in. And there was, wasn't any resistance that ever got back to me anyway um, that this was kind of how we wanted youth services to go in the, in the future. It was this 21st century skills we want to be building um, and we want to offer things that our students aren't able to get in their schools. And that's true for some, many of our students in Tucson anyway. Okay, here's a question about the organizations that you approach. So you mentioned going outside of the library to attract youth to the library. Are the organi other organizations that you approach, are they open to that, uh, open to the library coming in and um, trying to encourage the teens to, to become involved at the library too? Um, yeah, we've had a lot of great positive relationships with other organizations. Like I said, um, Girl Scouts was a big part of what we did, and they, um, at least our Girl Scout troop, they're happy to make badge requirements <laughs> for all sorts of different things. And that was, I think, how it started. Is if they did it, they got to earn a certain, you know, certain badges by participating. Um, we. This summer we partnered with um, Access Tucson, which is our local um, access, cable access station, and they were so happy to share youth really. I mean they have youth that participate every summer, but if we paid them then the youth didn't have to pay for their class. <coughs> so they were able to serve a much wider base of students who even though their classes are affordable, they are not free. Um, so they were really happy to attract new students to their facility and share their resources that way, and vice versa. Then the kids that do regularly go to them found out that the library also has other types of media classes. Um, let's see, the schools, we have a lot of charter schools in Tucson, and many of them um, are so happy that we have something to complement what they have to offer at their schools um, and have been really positive to us working together. Um, so there might be opportunities for us to do kind of internships with high school students or other ways that they can get deeply involved. Okay. Can you say more about the people who take the um, IT Nation classes? Who, who is taking those classes? And are there separate classes for younger kids or is it open to all ages? They're open to all ages, and it depends on the community that we teach the IT Nation classes to. So um, in some libraries, every time they offer it, they get a different audience. So sometimes it's seniors, sometimes it's adult, you know, middle-aged adults, sometimes it's their teenagers. Um, and we've had other libraries that they are just they weren't successful, but every year they try. Nobody comes to their classes, and they can't figure out why. And then they just move the time to Saturday afternoon instead of Wednesday night, and boom, they're full of people. Um, so it really depends on the location in the city that we offer them. Um, but we've had all sorts. We've had mixed classes, but it tends to be if there's teens, then only teens come to those classes. And if there's adults, then only adults come for the most part. But we have two to three instructors at every class, so they're able to handle, I think, whatever mix shows up. And what classes do you teach? They teach an um, Internet Savvy class, an Introduction to Photo Editing, an Introduction to Music and Sound Editing, an Introduction to Video Editing, and a Scratch Animation class. And they're all two-hour sessions. Okay. Do you require parental permission slips from teens who participate in programs so you can use their images online? Yes, we have a media release form that everyone has to sign because it's 
not just for their photos of them, but also for anything that they produce. Okay, good. We have five minutes left, so I think it would be a, a good time to just kind of mention what next, mention some resources that are out there. And I know we've had some people sharing things in the text chat. Again, if you have, um, if you are one of those people who you've, you've been doing a lot with this or you're aware of other programs, please share those in the text chat and I'll include those in the follow-up message too. But these were some resources that you shared, Jennifer. Do you want to talk about these a little bit? Okay, well the Innovation Center is a youth development organization website where um, it's referenced with the, la the Hearts Ladder. Um, there's a lot of stuff there and it's a great place to start, especially for the person who is asking for more um, to help them make a case to their administration. Um, the Create It link is to our website. It links kind of um, what classes we have going on and it has our Facebook feed in there so you can um, connect with us that way. IT Nation is actually a link to our Prezi that Kristen made. It's really beautiful and it has all of our statistics in it so we just go in and update it every semester. Um, and it's a really nice, well done presentation that kind of really sums up everything that we're doing. Um, then the PCPL, that's our YouTube channel and so it has the videos that we've made over the years. Um, you can also get to it from our website directly. And then that New York Times article is the one that um, is about Anna bringing Matt and that came out actually while I was at PLA, so I was pretty proud of that. I just thought I'd add it. That's great. One question that I missed in the text chat and that I think is a good one is, um, so you've mentioned that your system is bigger than the state of New Jersey and things like that. You're obviously a, a large system. Do you have any experience or advice for those in more rural areas, just where they've got fewer, fewer resources, less, um, fewer organizations to reach out to? Any advice or have you heard of programs in, in more rural areas? Um, I don't have any experience working in libraries in really rural areas, but I will say that um, even though there's less organizations locally, that doesn't mean there are not other organizations that would be willing to partner with you from afar. Um, and I was, I mean, it's a little plug for TechSoup, but that's really affordable way to get some technology in there for sure. Um, and then, yeah, what's in your state really and who is willing to fund initiatives? Because I'm seeing a lot of small state foundations that fund Arizona but rural areas. You know, for example, our Arts Council right now is concentrating just on rural areas. And um, I'm seeing a lot of initiatives like that, so there might be ways to get um, funding outside of the library world if you look at arts councils or small family foundations. Um, it's definitely worth the time to write those proposals, I would say. And LSTA funding, I'm, I'm a big fan now, <laughs> I must say. Okay, good. Well, um, just as a wrap up, another good question came in and I think that um, it might be a good way to wrap up. Just if you were going to leave us with just some the most important points to take away from this. People who are thinking about trying to get more youth involvement, more youth-led tech services, what, what are kind of the, the big points or things you're hoping that people are taking away from today? Um, well, that's always hard for me because I can talk obviously. Um, I would say the most important thing is, you know, youth are such a great resource for our community and um, really being able to shift that mindset is, would make, will make a huge difference in your community. And being an advocate for youth in that way and saying that these voices are so important to everything that we do um, will really change kind of the tone of everything that your community does if they can embrace youth. So if that means, um, inviting them to the table or if it means building them a center. I don't know what it's going to mean for you, but um, acknowledging them in that way is huge. And it's not an easy road to go for sure, but there are a lot of people out there doing it and they're, not, they're looking at them as assets and not problems. And it seems so simple, but it is really a big change in attitude and, um, and will really change everything because if you, ha if you can shift that, then all the services you provide will have that tone of welcoming your teens. So 
I don't mean to sound so esoteric, but I think that's the, really the core of it is it's about building um, a strong community in the end. That's great. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I know um, you just tons of ideas and lots of inspiration. So I really appreciate you being with us today. And Jennifer has shared her contact info. It's here: email, Twitter, Facebook. So those are ways to keep in touch with her. Again, I'll follow up today with an email too. So that will be that will be a way to keep in touch. We have another one of these benchmark webinars coming up on October 30th, and that's in that one we'll be talking about staff technology skills and creating a, a culture of really building on ongoing staff technology skills. And we've got some great speakers, Penny Talbert and Stephanie Zimmerman from Pennsylvania. That one's on October 30th, so that should be another good one. Thanks to ReadyTalk for sponsoring today. And again, there's um, an evaluation form. So if you would take the time to fill that out, that would help us a lot with, with feedback and with knowing what was, what was useful today and what will be useful in future webinars. So again, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Kevin, for all of your help too. And we'll wrap it up for today and hopefully see you online at another webinar soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.